The ancients looked at, at uh, manifest universe as being made up of four elements. And these four elements were all glued together and kept separate by a fifth element that they called spirit. The four elements were earth, air, water, and fire. In the classic image of the magician card, the magician stands in front of the table. And upon the table are four magical weapons. A wand, a cup, a sword, and a disc. These are the magician's weapons. These stand for the four Kabbalistic worlds. These stand for the four parts of the soul. These stand for the four tarot suits. Wands, cups, swords, and discs. Fire, water, air, and earth. In looking at humanity's relationship to the world, all ancient systems have first and foremost the idea of the four directions, or the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, north, south, east, and west, and, and uh, in different traditions these four directions or elements um, can be symbolized by different colors, different metals, different planets, there's many different ways of talking about these four elements. We see them again out pictured as the four suits of the tarot cards. We see this, this same symbology on every temple floor or lodge floor. These properties that are described in so many ways. There's layer on layer and layer of meaning to each of these directions. The four elements were used symbolically as the four most primary descriptors of the nature of all the manifest world. Things were had a kind of fiery, changing quality, or they had a, a, a fluid, watery quality to them, uh, an earthy and a, an airy, or thinking kind of ephemeral quality. And these again were just descriptors of the basic experience. And the human beings are always trying to understand what they feel, what they experience with their senses, what they know, and find ways of communicating it to other human beings and to themselves. So these are, are really useful handles that seemingly everybody can work with. Exactly what it is, is everything in the universe broken up into those four broad categories. Things that are earthy in nature, things that are airy in nature, things that are watery in nature and things that are fiery in nature. You see, everything is categorized in those four broad categories. 
For those who get a little squeamish around magical terminology, a much more down-to-earth statement of the same idea comes from classical physics. Physics classifies the four states of matter as solid, which corresponds to the alchemical earth, liquid, or water, gaseous, or air, and plasma, or fire. A theoretical fifth element has been postulated, called the ether, but was later dismissed. Now, the Hebrew Kabbalists split everything in the universe into four broad categories that they designated by the four holy letters, Yod, He, Vav, He. And we translate that, that formula or, in, or pronounce that formula, Jehovah. But actually, it's, it's not an anthropomorphic deity per se. It's, it's a formula. And it breaks the universe all the world into those four broad categories, the lowest of which is the material plane. And just above the material plane is the plane of ideas. And above the plane of ideas are the creative impulses that, that create those ideas. And above that is the life force itself. And those are relatively earth, air, water, and fire. They break the human soul up into those same four categories, the lowest of which is our body, the next highest is our, is our intellect, our mind. Um, above that is what they call soul intuition. It's sort of something that's, that's higher than the intellect, uh, but lower than the life force itself. And then finally is, is the life force. It's what we have in common with everybody else. We might call it a universal consciousness way that's all held together by the glue of that universal consciousness that, at least in the Western mystery traditions, they call spirit. yod heh vav -He is a wonderful formula, and in a way, probably the most simplistic uh, form of an initiatory society. yod he va -He. Fire, water, air, earth. Body, mind, emotion, spirit. These simple yet direct formulas provide a framework for the initiate's rise in conscious awareness and participation in higher and higher registers of existence. yod he vav -He, going that way, going down, going from fire, water, air, and earth, represents the descent of spirit into matter. That hey final is the world that we're living in, the material plane. It's represented in ourselves as, as the physical body. We have to take in the initiatory journey one step at a time. We have to first be masters of our immediate environment. Masters of the hay, if you will. Masters of the earth. Masters of our own environment and our own body. Until we're master of the world of hay, we could never hope to achieve the higher levels of consciousness. It's a step-by-step -step process. After we've achieved mastery of the, the hay world, the world of earth, if you will, next we need to master the intellect, the mind. Once that's mastered, we have to master our emotions. And after that, we have to master literally the life force itself. It's a step-by-step -step process. Whether it be from the tarot, alchemy, astrology, Kabbalah, or just about every other sacred simple system in recorded history, the four elements or the four planes of existence were the working tools of the magician. It was important for the initiate to begin the undertaking with an understanding of how we exist, act on, and can be influenced by forces on each of these planes or registers. The eerie insightfulness and utility of the four elements was recognized by many important scientists, including one of the fathers of modern psychology, Carl Jung. 
You know, in really understanding the nature of personality um, and how uh, a difference of, between people, the four functions, as Jung called them, really lend, that model lends itself best to really breaking down, well, the, you know, it's, it's basically Jungian personality typology. This, by the way, is the basis of the Myers-Briggs personality test, the w most widely used personality test in the world. It's, it's the most common test that every corporate setting, every work setting now uses in terms of understanding uh, in workers and their personalities. And we see that there's four categories, the four big boxes that all people fit into, and, this, the, and they're all based basically on the, uh, you know, the, the classic elements. Uh, there's the fire people, you know, Jung would call that the intuitives. And then there's the earth people, and that's the sensation, you know, the sensates. And the thinking people, you know, which would be the air people. And then there's the, the water people, which are, you know, the emotions and, and the feeling type. Modern psychology with, with Jung uh, has done quite a bit of work on further differentiating the four functions. And, and what Jung brought to that, the conversation was that um, two, there, the functions were based on two opposites. So thinking and feeling were actually opposites. And if we wanted to go elementally, we would say air and water are opposites. So that if you're strong, in thinking, you tend to be weak in, in feeling, and vice versa. Jung called those two, thinking and feeling, the rational functions, because they conform to a certain kind of um, logic and, and rationality to them. Even feelings had this kind of pattern to them. Jung said sensation and intuition we're also opposites. Usually, if you're high in the sensation, you're high in earth, you're pretty low in intuition and fire. Okay, they're opposites, uh, sensation and intuition. The goal, now we're talking about these four elements, the goal, we all have all different portions of each of them in our personality, and the goal is really wholeness in, in a way to have access to and uh, a working relationship with each of the four functions. The four parts of the soul aren't something that need to be ascended like a ladder, but integrated as a whole. Jung was not the first to discover that the interacting forces that comprise our psyche were plotted out with surprising accuracy in many of the ancient symbol systems that transmitted the mysteries. The fourfold structure of the manifest universe and the human psyche is also reflected in the symbolic structure of the tarot. Well, a wonderful illustration of this fourfold breakdown of the universe and the human soul can be found in the classic suits of the tarot. Now, the four suits of the tarot are wands, cups, swords, and discs. The lowest discs would represent the material plane or the human body. The next highest suit would be swords, which would represent the, the intellect and the human condition or the, the formative, the, the, the ideas, the pattern, if you will, behind everything that manifests on the material plane. Just above that is the suit of cups, and in a way the cups are the heart of God. And it represents not only our emotions and our emotional life, but that, that part of our soul that's intuitive in nature, that, that's above the intellect. And finally, at the very top, is the suit of wands. And the wands would, of course, be the suit of fire. And that fire, that very top condition, is the life force itself. And the human condition would be the will. The will of God. And actually, 
all of the other suits are aspects of that of that highest suit. There is an expression in esotericism, solve et coagulate. Like most initiatory arcana, it has many layers of meaning. But the applicable meaning here is that to really understand something, you have to take it apart and understand its components before putting it back together to understand the functioning whole. By understanding how the different bodies interact in and on the four worlds, we gain an important foundation in magical understanding. Our physical earth body, our mental air body, our emotional water body, and the fiery body of our synapses, life force, and creative inspiration. These are the trusted tools of the magician. Pentacles, or discs, are one of the four tools on the table of the magician. They represent the material plane. This is the physical world around us, our bodies, our physical environment, our possessions. Although in some systems, both ancient and modern, the physical plane is considered to be something that is to be abstained from and escaped from, the mysteries taught, as in the allegory of alchemy, that each of the four elements must be perfected, uplifted, and ultimately integrated to reach our highest potential. In the Western mystery tradition, we have the concept of the descent of spirit into matter. Using the yod hey fav hey formula, it'd be yod descending into hey, descending into vav, and finally descending into the hey final, the material plane. In a way, this puts the material plane in the position of sort of a stepchild element. Even the, the name yod hey vav hey, it doesn't even get a Hebrew letter of its own. It's just a hey repeated. But it gives us this concept that human beings are trapped in a tomb of matter. That all matter itself is just spirit being trapped in a tomb. the very well-known myth of Isis, Osiris, um, Horus, at one point, Set, who represents, Set represents the opposition, the denying force, he who does not wish to return to the light. Set traps Osiris at a party. The bait is a beautiful inlaid box that will, that will be given to whoever fits into the box perfectly. Osiris wants the box as much as anyone else, and it fits him perfectly. He goes into the box, and immediately he's in the box. It's hammered shut by Set and his helpers, and it's thrown into denial and disappears off to sea. That box is the material world, quite clearly. And if you're attracted by the box, that's what happens to you. If it gets hammered shut, that is your coffin. In a way, this is a very accurate point of view. We are spirit trapped in a tomb of matter. Just like in the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty, who finds herself unconscious, dead to the world, if you will, and trapped in a glass tomb. So all of these myths which embody basic truths then have something about um, a consciousness, an entity, a person, a god, a goddess, starting at the higher level, falling, or being pulled, 
or in another Hindu myth about Rama and Sita being stolen by Ravana, the demon god. So Sita, the queen goddess, was stolen and brought down, just as Hiram was slain by the jealous workers. So it's a very, very common story. And that, once again, that does not take away from its power. If anything, by retelling this common story in your own terminology, it makes it even more powerful because you will have a more um, distinct and close emotional reaction to it. So, the Solomonic myth to me is another version of the story that talks about the fall of consciousness, the descent of spirit into matter, the involution of spirit into the material world, and the other part of the Solomonic myth and many other of the same types of stories is about then the resurrection. Interestingly to me, the Solomonic myth also has shades of that whole story that's told so well in the Hindu mythology of the separation of uh, Shiva and Shakti, of the masculine and the feminine, and where from the crown center, the consciousness fell down to the root chakra, the fall of man, the Garden of Eden. Um, the death of the architect, the separation from the king, you know, the Christian myth. Each age has its points of purpose. Each age has its points of emphasis. In this last age, where the path of the renunciate was highlighted, we see an energy that involves a movement away from matter and up to God. And so both in the East and in the West, we see matter as the enemy. The bodies are bad, the world is bad, this is a veil of tears, the object of spiritual quest is to get out of this veil of tears, out of the body, get to nirvana as quickly as, as possible, do not pass go, do not collect $200, right? So the whole emphasis has seen matter as the enemy. And this means the body is seen as the enemy rather than as the temple of the soul. This was not true in earlier times. When you go back to Druidic teaching, you see that this was the place to be. This was where it was all happening. Because the, the perfection that exists in spiritual realms is a potential. It has to be actuated here. And so the idea is, yes, you have to withdraw from the enmeshing in physical matter, in the senses, but not abandonment. Detachment is not abandonment. And so you withdraw from the tides of the senses of matter to be in touch with those higher tides. But that's not an escape. The game plan is to take that higher life and bring it to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the work of the alchemist. The alchemist was not only that individual that engineered the divine marriage within themselves, that this merging of overshadowing soul and personality to become a whole integrated spiritual being focused in this time and place, having access to these other realms, having mastery, but choosing to work here for the sake of humanity.
to lift humanity, to lift the matter of the world involving the other kingdoms in nature. Humanity as a kingdom in nature is the consummate alchemist. It's the job we do for the planet. And so the emphasis in the past in seeing matter as the enemy must give way to seeing matter as the partner. This is why the alchemist always worked with the mystic sister, the soror mystica. The alchemist worked with the wife or the female counterpart. This was symbolic of the hand-in-glove relationship of the spiritual part of us with the material part of us. I mean, the whole term adept or master, adept at what? Mastery of what? Physical matter, emotional matter, mental matter. The world of the personality, the world that we all inhabit. And so we move past seeing the personality as the prison of the soul to the trusted servant of the soul. The instrument through which the soul can work, the conduit by which spiritual energies can be made actual and workable down here for the sake of transformation of the whole life of which we are a part. Not just the personality getting out of here and going to some wonderful place where we get wined and dined and uh, golden gated, as they say. <laughs> and the myth, in fact, it has a happy ending because the myth continues on after that and eventually Osiris will, will impregnate Isis in the form of a falcon and give birth to Horus, who represents the potential of return to the light, that should be our intention. As we begin then to rise back up the chakra system, as we begin to ascend into heaven, as we are brought back to life, as we are rescued and reunited with the beloved. And if that's not your intention specifically, in so many words, or at least tangentially underlying whatever it is that you want, the box is yours. As far as it goes, this is an accurate way of looking at things. But instead of viewing ourselves as a prisoner trapped in this tomb of matter, a prisoner who needs to escape somehow the prison of matter, the initiatory process recognizes the fact that the tomb itself is part of the big picture. We're not only trapped in a tomb of matter, we are the tomb of matter. Instead of having to escape the tomb of matter to get back to some heavenly estate, we literally have to transform the tomb itself along with us, transform ourselves into higher and higher levels of consciousness, literally taking the tomb with us. It's not an escape. It's a transmutation. Until that can be achieved, until that can be mastered, we don't have any hope to climb to higher levels of initiation. It's a step-by-step -step process whereby we raise our consciousness from hay to vav to hay to yod. According to alchemical tradition, each of the elements must be purified before they can be of use in the later process of integration. On the material plane, this includes, among other things, detoxification and a general uplifting of the physical form, the body. My name is Dr. Rupa Chari, and this is my brother Deepak Chari. And together, we have an alternative medical health center called the Chari Center of Health in San Diego, California, where we incorporate nutrition, detoxification, remarkable mind-body techniques, and the most amazing transformative technologies.
We were personally very inspired by The Secret, and the main value we saw in The Secret was that it really reinforces and emphasizes some of the main fundamental laws of attraction, and ultimately everything boils down to mastering the fundamentals in any subject or profession. Another thing that we found to be very important in manifesting your desires is to take care of one's physical health, and that includes nutrition, hydration, exercise, and plenty of rest. And in addition, it's very important to detoxify your body. And by that, I mean detoxifying the elimination organs. And that includes the colon, the liver, and the kidneys. And the reason for that is one, it eliminates waste materials from the body. But in addition, in Chinese medicine, they found that our different organs actually store different emotions. For example, the liver stores anger, the gallbladder stores rage, and the kidney stores fear and anxiety. And personally, after doing a very intensive colon cleanse, I did a liver cleanse. And I couldn't believe it until I personally experienced it. That yes, it was a very profound physical detoxification, but in addition, I had a physical and emotional healing. Emotions that were suppressed probably for years came up to the surface to be released and healed. So it was profoundly healing for me personally, and I've seen that professionally as well. That's why it's best to avoid putting toxic substances into your body, such as alcohol. Alcohol actually degenerates one of the most important organs that we have in our body, and that's the liver. And our body tries to regenerate the liver whenever it's damaged. But when the liver is damaged, they found that that's one of the key organs that after a period of time, if it's not repaired, can lead then to degenerative diseases, such as cancer. So that's why it's very important to take care of your organs as if you would take care of your child and to put proper nutrients and juices and fresh fruits and vegetables into your body to get the proper nutrients in so that your body can eliminate the waste so you can maintain an absolutely wonderful state of health and vitality. whether it's cigarettes or alcohol or excess sugar or not exercising and not resting and overworking. All of these are symptoms of self-sabotage behaviors which ultimately leads to a deep-rooted feeling of self-hate. By taking care of your health, by clearing physical and emotional blockages, you'll actually manifest your dreams much quicker. And it also sends an intention out to the universe and to yourself that you're taking care of your needs and putting yourself first. We have seen dramatic healings take place when one takes personal responsibility for their health with regards to nutrition and rest and detoxification, and very importantly as well, deep emotional healing. In the yod heh vav -Hey formula, the final hay, the lowest of the initiatory planes, is the material world itself. Mastery of the material world means not only taking care of your own health, mastering your health, mastering the conditions of your environment, making a living, literally the work that's right under our nose to do. Part of putting one's house in order is to put the earth in order and that is really symbolized by money. It's the, the thing that allows commerce uh, of things in community and society. So really making money is not a good or bad thing. It's just how society functions. And that's something that we need to just kind of put our house in order about. Becoming the emperor or ruler of our material plane means our financial life must become a magical practice meaning that we must learn to work in a coordinated fashion on all registers. Not just the physical, but the emotional and mental planes as well. Your life is demonstrating your values. Now, if you're having an injection of values and you think, well, I want to be wealthy, and really number 20 on your values is wealth, then I can tell you as long as your hierarchy of values is number 20 on wealth building and saving money, you're not going to be wealthy. 
is not going to happen. Because the second money comes into your life, no matter how much it is, it will be spent according to the hierarchy of your values. So if you have higher value on children, children's education, children's clothes, home, uh, entertainment, parties, cars, etc., number 20 is saving money, you will run out of money before you save. So unless money is near the top, where you pay yourself first and save money and learn how to manage it and study it and organize it, it's a fantasy. And you're going to frustrate yourself. And even though conscious, you say, I want to be wealthy, you're not going to manifest it. I ask people by the thousands when I stand in front of a large audience, I say, how many of you want to be wealthy? And they all put their hands up. I ask them, how many are actually wealthy? And all put their hands down. Just, just a handful of people put their hands up, unless I'm at a financial seminar where people are very wealthy. And it's quite interesting. And they go, hmm, they don't feel great about that. But the reason is because they all consciously they say they want to be wealthy but they unconsciously aren't. So, how do we change that? How do we take something that's low on our values and raise it up so we now can start to see the opportunities and act upon them? Because again, if you don't have a high value on something, you won't see the opportunities and act upon them. So the first thing you do is to take and identify your values. You look again at how you fill your space, how you spend your time, how you spend your energy, how you spend your money, etc., and go through what I call the Dr. Martini's value determining process. When you've gone through that de determining process and you look at your values and you look at what your life demonstrates, you go, oh, no wonder my life is the way it is. I realize right now that I have a lot more value on buying clothes than saving money. A whole lot more value on making sure my kids are okay and, and have good food and a nice home than saving money. I realize I have a whole, uh, I'd rather go on vacation every year than save $3,000. And you realize exactly why you're where you are. It's self-evident. So then what you do is you say, all right, you decide what those values are and then you go back and rearrange them the way you say you would love to have them. Now, this may not be the way you are right now, but this is the way you think you want. This is based on maybe those that you've injected or something you've read about or whatever. You think, well, if I have uh, money at the top, maybe I'll be happy or something. You've got to realize that no matter what set of values you create, you're going to have both pain and pleasure. You're going to have happiness and sadness. You're going to have support and challenge. You're going to have kind and You're going to have all polarities of life, no matter what set of values you have. So if you have an idea that, oh, if I have this over here, I'm going to be happy is another fantasy. And that will eventually be eroded over time. Now, I've had the opportunity to spend time with people. I spend a day with some people. I've had people come up to me and say, Dr. Martini, you know, I'm 45 years old. I have nothing to show for it. I'm, I've got twenty to $30,000 in debt right now with credit cards and a, a bank note. I'm concerned about my future. Um, my kids are starting to, you know, get into teenage years. I've got college coming up, and I'm overwhelmed. And I now realize I can't, I can't lie to myself. I really need to get going on finances. Is there anything you can do? So what you do is you write down a minimum of 200, preferably three, four, or 500, and even up to 1,000 reasons and benefits of why saving money and building wealth will be to your advantage. How will it serve you? How will it serve your loved ones? How will it serve the world? And stack up general reasons and benefits. Because until you have a big enough why, the hows won't take care of themselves. You have to have a reason for building wealth. So you stack up the reasons. Because if the reason for you spending money is greater than you saving money, you're going to spend money. If your reason for spending money on your kids and their education is more than you saving, you're going to do that. So you've got to stack up way more reasons on saving money than you do have for all the other things you're doing right now. So if you write down a thousand reasons, which may take you two or three months to get them all down on a computer, as you do, you're setting up new myelinization in the brain. You're setting up new dendrites, new pathways in the brain to now see those opportunities and act upon those opportunities in your sensory and motor functions. So what happens is you're literally increasing the probability, not the guarantee, but the probability, the more you stack up. Now, let's just say that you go, but I don't want to sacrifice my kids for that. And I don't want to, I want to take my vacation. I want to keep a nice house. So I want to put wealth number four, not number one five. So what you do is you find out where you want to put it between four and five and then you ask after you've done that thousand uh, benefits, general benefits, you now go in and say how specifically is saving money and building wealth and mastering money going to specifically help me in my vacations in my home? And you link it directly between where you want it in your value hierarchy. And you now answer that 200, 300, 400 or however many times until you see clearly that by saving money and building wealth you're going to get exactly what you want. Your life is demonstrating your values. If your values have been this whole set 
and now you're wanting to change it, it's wise to stack up the benefits and link it in to what you know you've been demonstrating consistently. Wherever you're most disciplined, that's where you want to link it. Because then if it's linked to that and you think you're going to get what's most disciplined to you, you increase the discipline of focusing and saving money. Because what we do is we do that exercise and we stack them. I just push them through and stack up the, the benefits and stack up the links and associations until they see such a vivid idea. And then we go in there and we look at exactly how the strategies are and how to do it. How are we going to make the wealth we want? We define what it is. If you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going, wealth is not real. It's fantasy. By cross-associating our attitudes and actions about money with our deepest motivations and even what we can observe of our subconscious patterns and aversions, we can truly exercise financial magic. This card is, is one of the spirit cards, or trump cards in the tarot. This is the emperor, and this is trump four. Now this is a spirit card. Tarot is, is really cool that way, in that it has a whole separate deck for just symbols of spirit. This is called the major arcana in tarot. I've come up with a whole new deck that's just spirit cards, called uh, TMP. But in this traditional weight tarot card, you can see this is the um, symbol of the number four. This is the four. This is quaternity. This is symbolizing structure, the structuring power of the human mind is what four is really about, is how we structure experience. The Emperor card symbolizes the rulership of our domain through order and discipline. Any areas of our lives we don't assume rulership of, we leave open for someone else to rule often taking rulership over us in the process. The word sometimes associated is order, but I like the word dominion. And it's, it really says you have to be, you know, you have to be the ruler of your own house. You have to have dominion over your own physical space, o over your own human uh, obligations and responsibilities. Um, you have to put your house in order before you can really continue on the journey. I think that, you know, in my own personality style with money, one of the things I've, I've learned a lot from my wife has helped me a lot is non-attachment to, uh, my, it's just money, and there's a sense of um, you have it, enjoy it, spend it, pass it over, give it away, um, don't hold on to it, and t it tends to keep on coming, and there's a sense of, uh, it's, it seems like there, uh, there's something special about it that we want to hold on to or pursue or uh, it scares us or whatever, but actually it's just energy. Uh, money is something that can empower people. I think it's our fear of money that drives us to hoard it or to uh, not be able to generate it or to be you know, obsessed with it. But in and of itself, it's, it's just a, it's a good thing. Now, there's many tarot cards that talk about building your temple on the material plane. For instance, in this card, the three of pentacles, very simply, if you interpret the card just by the information on this, in this piece, the three is the number of process, it's the pro number of things in motion, becoming, and it's in the element of earth, you know, we talked about earth. Um, so it has a sense of building, and you see in the in the in the actual image that there it looks like a, some kind of sacred place because there's an arch here, and uh, there's three figures in here that are talking about the building of the temple, um, and the interpretation, you know, more psychologically of this card in today's world is. Uh, the phrase I use is, building your own sacred abode. Now, that has to be, you know, translated into your life today. Your modern, postmodern, 21st century life can be like a temple. It may be, you know, 
taking, you know, driving down to the train station and, and you know, if you're living in the East and, and going, going to work and doing what you do in, in work and coming home and, you know, uh, kissing the wife and, and playing with the kids and, and going about your life, your ordinary life, as if it were a sacred temple. Now, sacred temple is an important symbol for me because I think it. A sacred temple doesn't mean that it's a blissed out nirvana. You know, all kinds of things happen in a sacred temple. You know, there's a bathroom in the sacred temple, right? Uh, there's all kinds of business. You know, they cook in the sacred temple. They, you know, they pay their bills in the sacred temple. They do everything. What makes it um, a temple? is the recognition that it's a dwelling and it's a dwelling for uh, more than ourselves and it, it is endowed with spirit you know and sacred well that's our attitude that's our appreciation and respect for what we have it's shifting our you know, shifting our awareness level in kind of our mindset. That's how I would like it. our mindset, which is is being so programmed by conventional pictures we see on uh, in the news, or that we kind of pass in mean, our our local uh, mythologies, etc. And um, we we kind of tend to fill it up with a lot of the conditioned. I think constructed unreal events that are more in the background truthfully deconstructing the, the all of the the de delusions that are around us and all the filtering and so that we that is in a way sacralizing or making what is you know important and sacred The mysteries continually pointed out that the bittersweet blessing of existence on the material plane was vital and necessary. Vital for the matter that is uplifted by consciousness, and vital for consciousness which learns, grows, and evolves from its experience in matter. I describe the human being as actually having a you might say a mortal and immortal component. I believe that we are actually energetic, immortal beings having a mortal experience. So a big question a lot of people have is, why are we here? Why are we in physical dense bodies? And why does the world exist? Why does the universe exist? Because you have to answer this question before you can even begin to justify doing the kind of work that is supposed to take you to a higher plane of existence and give you a consciousness that will live beyond the physical form. Otherwise, why bother? You know, eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you're dead. Boom, that's it. Goodbye. Well, throughout time, throughout history, in just about every culture, just about, people have said, there's got to be more. And have said, let's see if we can figure it out. And as we've talked about before, there is seemingly full blown a thought form that says there's not just one life per consciousness. You've been here before, you'll be here again. Some of the systems even say, not only have you been here before, you've been in other planets, you've been in other star systems. So there's this whole elaborate explanation for why we're here and what we're doing. And in many instances, it's a school, and we're here to learn. I tend to believe that we are immortal mind souls uh, incarnating and vehicleized by a mortal form to gather, like a Pac-Man, information on what we haven't loved so we have a greater opportunity to love. When we attune to our sensory reality of the mortal form, we tend to be fooled 
and avoid and seek and live in a duality. And in that state, uh, we are, in a sense, run as an automaton reacting to what our misperceptions are. Necessary in the journey of learning, but ultimately elusive. And then we also have a more transcendent state where our minds are not avoiding and seeking, but are actually poised and present in a state of equilibrium where the glimpse of divinity is revealed. And we, as a soul, shine through our mind with illumination and radiance and give birth to genius and music poetry and art or great leadership. What are we here to learn? We're here to learn how life works, how the cosmos works, why? So that we can become conscious creators. Why? Uh, okay, sometimes the answer is just for the pure joy of it. Sometimes the answer is God needs help. Sometimes the answer is because there's a whole nother system out there of entities waiting to come in to the level where you are and they need to be taught and the path needs to be laid. So there's all kinds of explanations for it. What makes the most sense to me is a bit of a combination of all of them and that as conscious beings we have in order to develop the most intimate awareness of existence come into physical dense existence. And then to put that awareness to use, we are rising up out of physical existence. Another way to look at it, as some of the esoteric scientists would tell you, is that in Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, that matter cannot be created, energy cannot be created, they just move back and forth across this equal sign, across this transformative divide, if you will. In just the way the cosmos works, things do cross that divide, and so energy, us, as consciousness, crosses that divide and moves into matter, and moves into the experience of being matter, and then moves back out of it and says, wow, that was cool. Or, we could improve on that. That the cosmos has come and gone and come and gone. In Sanskrit, it's called the Manvantara, when the cosmos is in physical manifestation, and Pralaya, when it's at rest. And you see this burgeoning and shrinking, the Big Bang and the Big Crunch. You see it reflected in mythologies. You see it in the Hindu Vedic mythologies, you see it in the Mayan. You see it in a lot of mythologies that talk about the cycles or that talk about the old gods and then they were defeated by the new gods that rose up and then those gods were overthrown by the next one. It's about cycles. So in one of these tellings, the reason that we're here in physical dance now is because this current cosmos as we know it was made from, of course, the stuff of the last cosmos. But it was a different formula back then. And the formula that we're using right now is not exactly the right one in order to provide a good background, a good support, a good structure for the predominance of spirit, of soul, of consciousness that the other system was more heavy into matter. And what we're trying to do as conscious souls incarnate, quasi-consciousness sometimes, but 
is to redeem and uplift matter. And that's one of the goals of the mystery schools, is to get conscious people to redeem and uplift matter, to rework the way that actually the physical little tiny bits and bobs of yourself down to the quantum level work. That's also another very good reason for doing the physical cleanup in that first step, is that we're here to redeem and uplift matter, which has become trapped in its own prison. Just as we are spirit trapped in a body, just as we are spirit trapped in our minds, just as we are spirit trapped in our emotions, it's our job to transform, transmute, and overcome these tombs we are entrapped in.